Welcome to For the Love of Books, Bees Books Edition, a podcast by North Lancashire Libraries. Hello, this is Barry. And this is Jenny. And we're here to talk about Bees, Bees Books. Books. We're also here to talk in a pretty haunted room, yes. I must say, which is <laughs> bizarre because it's blue sky sunshine yep. haunting, which you don't usually no. associate, but... I don't know if that's scary or not. Ah, yeah, because... At least you're on guard when uh-huh. it's creepy and spooky. <laughs> oh, you're right. Oh. Ignorance is bliss, yes, though. Absolutely. If you don't know and you're going to get haunted, I'd rather that than be yes. on tender hooks. <laughs> um, but anyway, this time we have a theme that I had completely forgotten about <laughs> until, like, no, no, I totally knew what whatever I always think and dream of this theme that B gives us. But this time the theme was a different point of view. Which I co- quite enjoy in life and in Absolutely. literature. Yes. Um, but uh, this one's, uh, as you can see, how prepared I am <laughs> with this theme that I totally knew about um, two hours ago. Um, so yes, so it's going to be quite a wild ride, I yeah. think. I think when when B gave it to us last time, it was like, oh yeah, that's nice and easy. And then uh-huh. I can do anything. And then it's, oh wait, no, mm-hmm. that's not as easy as it seemed. It's also, I think, like... So it can be approached in many ways, like a very direct thing, yeah. but it can also, I think that choice, that illusion of choice, I don't know if it's an illusion, it is a real reality <laughs> of choice, can be quite... Um, overwhelming. Uh-huh. Yes, uh-huh. Yes. yes. So what have you, uh, you so, fought through your overwhelm and yes, what have you brought yes. us? So my first book is called Remarkably oh. Bright Pictures by, you might have to help me here, Shelby Van Pelt. Yes, sure. It has a beautiful cover. Mm-hmm. absolutely beautiful cover um, and it is a fantastic book oh it's I'm glad the nicest book I've read for a long long time oh. um, it's just a nice a nice book oh. um, and I will explain why there's a different point of view in it um, I, I, it's on my list so I do know oh, why good but I haven't read it yet mm-hmm. but I was actually a bit like the reviews seemed good but mm. then the ones the negative reviews I read like were a bit off-putting so I'm actually really like looking forward to what oh, you right. want to say okay. about it. Well, you already and, know I think it's nice. So. Oh, well, yes, but in what way? Ah, right, okay. I'm <laughs> just trying to draw the attention, <laughs> Jenny, forgive me. So I have two books. One is digital, which you hate, Boo Hiss, <laughs> and one is physical. <laughs> you made like a bit of it. Which also, it could be a comedy. Mm-hmm. So one is a book that I think you know as well. Yes. It's called Our Lady of Mysterious Ailments by... T. L. Huchu, I think is how he yeah, says his how name. Yeah, I've seen it as well. Yes, right? okay. And my other book, uh, so this one I thought was fantasy, mm-hmm. and it is quite kind of like fantasy. And I went looking for it confidently in our fantasy shelves, and I was betrayed because it was not. <laughs> it was in general fiction, which I I'm actually not mad at. Mm-hmm. I quite like this genre mixing sometimes mm-hmm. only so, sometimes that was a very sometimes very series. sometimes yes <laughs> <laughs> and my other thing other book i'm listening to i haven't finished it's called unruly by oh. david mitchell and the subtitle is a history of england's king and queens which sounds very very serious yes, and it does. uh boring and it is not okay it's really funny and david mitchell i don't know if you know him mm-hmm. yeah. yeah so he, he he's reading it himself oh. which is my favorite kind of like Fabulous. when people read it and he's also just deranged and he mm, talks yeah. about how deranged the kings and queens are so i'm just i'm having a great time excellent yes but uh, oh i haven't said why my thing no two <laughs> point of view so for me it's a different point of view the first one our lady mm-hmm. as i'm gonna abbreviated <laughs> is a different view of the future mm-hmm. it's a dif- looking at the future in a way that messes with history a bit messes with magic and technology a bit and comes to this dystopian question mark um, future and an unruly uh, the thing is a different point of view of the past because it's okay. like he's tried he's found a lot of especially to me actually for me it's really interesting because the first book Our Lady is set in Scotland and it's very much about Scottish magic and Scottish uh, as opposed to English or like international magic but it also talks a little bit about people in Scotland and places and sort of historical development mm-hmm. which I'm not super familiar with so like the, both the history and like the current thing which I know a bit more of and this one unruly like the kings and queens of like I know nothing about. I mean, I know some things. That's yeah. not true. I know Henry VIII created a bit of problems and <laughs> things like that. But 
it was so funny i started listening to it when i was away and like just walking around uh, newcastle and listening to it and at one point david mitchell says um that you know so uh, this fact edward the conqueror something 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 like he gave a fact and he's like which most people know and uh, narrowing it down to all the people who are listening to this definitely know and i'm like and if you happen to be somebody who's listening to this book or who's reading this book and doesn't know this you are a statistical anomaly you like <laughs> fought the algorithms because you've had, had no interest in the subject and suddenly you're coming to one specific <laughs> that is like i no, he, no, i am no. an anomaly anomaly he also said i should we should write to him because he was really interested in knowing how we got to this that i don't know him oh. to do or no i might i might but yeah it was really interesting because we don't learn about british history or, or scottish history or english history or whatever northern irish irish in the same way in india obviously like mm-hmm. our interaction with british history is quite like you came over here and this is so we don't know about the kings and the queens mm-hmm. except like Victoria and Elizabeth and whoever was a part of the thing. Mm-hmm. So it was it's it was very interesting. So it is giving me a different point of view but also the books themselves I think offered a different point of view of both the past and the future and the present I think. Oh, you, for somebody who was like last minute this is quite well thought out. <laughs> I have read it, <laughs> read it, it together while I was talking. Excellent. Yes. <laughs> so do you want to tell me about your very yes. nice book? Yes. So it is um basically set in a kind of aquarium um not a big kind of sea world mega one it's more of a kind of smaller one and um basically it is the there is a octopus a grand pacific octopus i think to give its full title called marcellus and it's actually called marcellus mcsquiggles no no Marcellus mixed squiddles. Oh. Yes, a higher. Because the owners... I like that even more. You said mix squiggles and then you said no. I was like, there's no way she's going to talk this. I want it to be mix squiggles. And then you said mix squiggles. Exactly. Yes. Exactly. You did top it. Yes. So the owner's daughter named um, Marcellus. Mm-hmm. Um, and how it ties in with a different point of view is that throughout the book, the octopus basically is talking to you so you're kind of it's almost like diary entries from the octopus oh. um and basically in the aquarium there's a cleaner who comes in at night and the octopus kind of observes her um and works things out um and i'm trying not to give too much away which is terrible because uh, <laughs> no please don't because this i'm definitely going to read this one um and it's just a lovely story so you kind of know where it's going to go you Mm -hmm. kind of know some of the characters and how they're going to interact but it was quite nice that you knew because we like surprises we do like surprises but there wasn't anything horrible lurking in the background oh i'm I'm, thank you You for saying that because i'm all you know when you're watching or reading things about animals especially it i'm really like anxious about bad things happening Uh, people as well but it's, I guess I'm like <laughs> people people yeah. but animals be- the only reason is because I think storytellers use it as a cheap trick sometimes mm-hmm. yeah, to yeah. like the most recent example I can think of is Guardians of the Galaxy the mm-hmm. third uh, movie for those who have not watched it or are not interested in it I knew exactly what was going to happen the moment the cute little uh, disabled animals were introduced and oh, I knew yeah. and it, it did happen and it felt like I was I obviously cried and like yeah, cried somehow, whatever. Yeah. and but I felt so angry I was furious because I knew that my emotions were being manipulated yeah. and not in a like justifiable way mm-hmm. in like a very so I'm glad yes no no it's, nothing it's, it's, happens to make squiggles I mean you know I'm not going to spoil it. Life, but sure, yes, but not but nothing, murder. No, no, exactly, exactly. Uh-huh. But it's lovely to see. So he just has like wee short kind of chapters at the beginning of each kind of section, and basically he knows that he's he's because he can read, so he can read his wee kind of label at the front that tells him what his name is. Um, he can also understand people, um, and he's a great observer observer of of people. Oh. So he can read this, and it knows he knows that he's got so many days basically that his life is um so his first um oh oh that's already so sad it's day 1299 of my captivity so he kind of knows 
you know, himself that he's got a lifespan. Oh, and he um, also knows he's a prisoner. Yes, except he's not. I'm going to give this a wee bit away. Um, because he is able to escape his enclosure. Oh. And he goes, so he's not happy with the food he gets. He especially likes sea cucumbers, which are a couple of tanks down. Oh. So occasionally he escapes and eats the sea cucumbers. Um, mm. And the owners kind of wonder why. Why is there only six sea cucumbers this week? Oh. Um, <clears throat> he kind of escapes. He also quite likes like random takeaway and things like that. Because obviously, modern, yes. Because <laughs> obviously, there's people coming and going, you know, and they throw things away, and he'll go and he'll kind of look. Um, and the cleaner um, kind of discovers him one day tangled up um, in some wires because he's got out, but he can only stay out of his tank for so long. Um, otherwise there are consequences you can't see this but I'm doing speech marks mm -hmm. um, and so she kind of untraps him and puts him back in um, and they kind of have not a relationship as such but he kind of knows things but can't really he can't tell her what he knows but he can leave clues and things like that mm. um, and it's lovely seeing the world from his point of view because he basically can tell people are related just by their fingerprints on the the glass on the front of his um it's not yeah. a cage at all is it parry uh dang tank yes thank you um you know and he has been in the ocean before he was um saved he got um mangled slightly and that's why he's here um, recuperating and then they kind of kept him um and so he knows things from the ocean that kind of are relevant to Tova, the, um, I'm saying Tova, yes, um, the, the cleaner. You believe in yourself. Yes, yes. yes. <laughs> um, so she's got um, a kind of past, so her son passed away when he was young, um, her husband recently passed away, and like it's almost like going and doing the cleaning, um, and she's very like strict she has her way she brings her own cleaner in that she makes herself and all this kind of stuff and she says hello to all the the inhabitants um as she's going around so she always says hello to marcellus not realizing that he actually can yeah. understand her she's not keen on some of them like the kind of eels and things like that but she still says hello yeah. um and then there's another character another main character who comes into it who's kind of this young guy who's just kind of you know, not sure of his destination in life. Um, he doesn't know who his father is, um, and he finds something and is given something to kind of indicate this town. So he comes to do some, you know, digging. Um, decides this person is his father, and mm. like you know, tries to get in contact with him, all that kind of stuff. But him and Tova's lives kind of cross slightly because he's not, he's not got a job or anything like that. So. Um, something happens to Tova, she hurts herself so he kind of takes over the cleaning for a while um, and again I'm trying not to give too much away mm. <laughs> um, but it's it's a lovely interaction between them and then sometimes you see Marcellus's um, view of their relationship from inside the, the tank mm. um, and it's just a, just a lovely, lovely book yeah. it's just one of those ones that you could read in one go with like some hot chocolate, you know, just kind of cozied up. Yeah. Um, it, it's just a lovely book. Well, I'm also super interested in it because I think many years ago now, I'd read this, like, I read a lot of long form articles and it was about octopuses and how intelligent they are, but it's almost kind of this alien intelligence because we don't know. Like, we're trying to understand them from a human centric perspective, but actually they have like their own skills and you know like how they say that we've you know explored much more of space than we have yeah. of underwater and oceans and octopuses i think like form a part of that like they're super intelligent but in a very different kind of way that scientists are still trying to understand and that article just got me really so fascinated by octopuses and I, i'm pretty sure we have a book as well it's like a non-fiction book like a big sort of thick thing about octopus intelligence which has been on my list for ages but 
I've heard such good things about this book. Mm -hmm. So, which is such a good way to, you know, like how you do uh, when you say that, you know, you're reading something and then you follow the yeah, trails. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So, that's something that this would be such an accessible way to do that is that obviously for those who don't want to do that, it's fine. Yeah, like yeah. the story itself yeah, seems to be really good. But for those who do, there's this whole like world out there where the truth is actually strange. So like the things that you were saying, the examples of the intelligence, I'm not sure how much of that is based mm -hmm. on truth or not, but must, shall be master, shall be first name, yes, uh, must have, <laughs> um, you know, done some research about mm -hmm. octopus intelligence having to write about like, I think you this. can, like, um, you know, like wee video clips and things like that. I think they are very clever, you mm -hmm. know. Um, at one point in the book, they're kind of, they test him and weigh him and do all sorts of things just to see how he's getting on. Yeah. Um, the guy that owns the aquarium and was scientist stroke biologist. Mm -hmm. Marine think. biologist. Mar yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> Together, <laughs> yes. we can do it. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, you know, at one point they do kind of weigh him and go, hmm, he's quite big. Oh. And then, hmm, there's only eight sea cucumber <laughs> there, you know, it's, it's that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, but they do, like, kind of do... Like they'll put a peanut or something inside something else and see that if he can get into it, mm. and he's like, "Puff, this is you know so easy, you yeah. know I'm not even going to try and make it look difficult." And obviously he can get out of his tank, and you know at one point they kind of put a brick on top, and and it's like, yeah, <laughs> yeah. you can't thwart me, you know. And um, I think they are very intelligent, uh -huh. you know, they can do things. And at one point they do say in the book. I think it's him himself kind of say that they have like a slight, as you say, alien intelligence and the look of them as well. Yeah. And the fact that they can get out of such a small space, yeah. it's almost as if they kind of mm -hmm. can like yeah. completely flatten themselves and, and things like that. And that like, to me, you know, that's really exciting. Like learning about these things that we don't know is... I mean, for some people, I guess it might be depressing how little we know about the world. <laughs> uh, but just over the last, you know, 100, 200, even like whatever, more centuries, we've learned so much about the world. And now that we're turning to space and looking at space and alien life forms and things, like we, and obviously popular culture plays such a big part of that, like TV shows, movies, literature, yeah, yeah, things. But it sort of, I think, expands our imagination of what alien life could look like, what intelligence could look Absolutely. like. We're learning things about trees as well. I mean, we have been for the past few decades, but it's seeping into, like, mainstream conversations as well. And it's just like we're sharing, you know, this world with so many other kinds of, like, creatures and inhabitants, as you said. And just learning more about that Absolutely. is so cool yeah. it's just so fantastic so i quite like the idea that on one of the planets it's mostly water there is a whole octopus like, yeah yes you know, and we are in a tank going on. <laughs> yes exactly they're like experimenting <laughs> with us yeah i i do so it's so like i've just come from reading this children's book in india like i've been reading for this thing that i've been judging and that actually made me really emotional because it was it's sort of like a mixture of history and imagination um, but she researched these menageries in Britain, like during the um, sort of, I think, 1800s, mm -hmm. um, early 1900s. So it was like basically a lot of people in uh, England who were traveling to different parts of the world and they'd never seen these animals before and stuff. So and a lot of them came from India. So that was her Indian connection. So like lions and tigers and cheetahs and things. And she was writing it from a child's perspective, one having questions about all these animals that live in these menageries. And at that time, there was no this conversation about animal rights and no, things absolutely. like that. So the elephants and tigers, they'd all been in these tiny little cages mm -hmm. and all together, no exercise, no fresh air. Um, and the people were really excited to see them and things, but some of the people were not very nice and things. Mm -hmm. They'd poke, they'd want them to roar, they'd want them to be like, their imagination mm -hmm. so it was quite sad looking at it from the animal's perspective which is why when you read day 1000 <laughs> whatever it kept it like oh no <laughs> like squidward but no I, I think I, I'm hoping this has a happier yes ending yes. than those poor little <laughs> elephants that I've been reading about that. but no that I'm absolutely sold it was, I was already like middling mm -hmm. But yes, it no, it does sound like it a great It also has book. a very nice color. It does. I l especially love, um, it has a basket, the octopus on the cover has a basket of sea cucumbers, question? Possibly, possibly. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so this book, Our Media, Our Media of 
yeah, th- that's what I'm going to call it. Our lady of mysterious okay. illness. Our lady of mysterious illness is something that you've read as well, and it was it's the second book in a series, and I think it is very much fantasy. I don't I know science so. fiction. I would I, like. I guess it's in the future. It's a bit like the Ben Aranavanich ah. apologies um, books that are classed as crime, uh-huh. but it's like wizard solving crime so you get that's quite a generalization that no but he does write in his Mm -hmm. acknowledgements about that he writes that he was really inspired by that and it's very place-based so i haven't read the books i've seen them on our shelves gorgeous covers like Mm -hmm. the map of london and things but because they've been crime i've not been like super drawn to it but when he said it was fantasy i was like Ooh, yeah. now maybe I'll give it a shot. So that's why I wasn't mad at this being in the general fiction section because maybe people who wouldn't usually have Absolutely. picked it up Absolutely. would be able to see it and give it a shot. Mm-hmm. And I love that it's so place-based. So it's based in Edinburgh and he very much uses the city and uh, its history but also its architecture mm-hmm. in his stories. So it's about a girl named Ropa. Mm-hmm. And she's a ghost talker is what, uh, like in the first book, that's what she communicates with ghosts, but she's very grumpy about it, doesn't really love it. She is quite grumpy. Yeah, she is. (laughs) And she's 15, and she's definitely a 15. Absolutely. Like, she has a lot of responsibility. She lives with her grandma and her younger sister, and she's the main breadwinner. It's a society that's set at some indeterminate time in the future. I don't think it's too far in the future. No, I it's think not it's because she they know enough about the past. Yeah, absolutely. And they still have technology and things. Yeah. Like they still have like, you know, payment things and like whatever. It's just like world the world functions. But there's other things like the princess gardens uh, in the city has become like the swamp it used to be and everyone's like poorer and like there's something that's happened in Scotland. Yeah, you feel as if there's something mm-hmm. has happened and you're not quite sure No, because there's just hints about yeah. it, like the calamity or whatever they call it. And the king has taken over and at this time it was, when I started doing the first book, uh, Elizabeth was still queen at that Absolutely. time. So that was a very clear indicator it was in the future. Whereas here it's like King George, but they keep referring to him as the king and we're like, okay, that's more... But it, again, we don't know. No. And, but we uh, don't need to know. We it don't doesn't detract from no, it all. It just no. makes it slightly like, serious. Yeah, and it's like you're always almost in conversation with it because the things that you're conjuring in your imagination are almost like the if it was written down, it might be a little bit of a letdown. Whereas here, you're like, ooh, what's happened? Yeah. Ooh, what's the thing? And this is what she's living in this life, trying, has a pet fox. Well, a friend fox, I won't say pet. And it's just like going around trying to make ends meet. And she's since she's like has responsible for the food and like whatever of the thing. That's how she earns money in the first book. In the second book, she's found a secret society of sorts. Um, and the first book also had a fantastic title, which is what I was uh, drawn to, The Library of the Dead. Absolutely, that's why I was, started. Yeah, it. yeah. <laughs> it's like a library of the dead in like, Calton Hill? Colton Hill? Is Colton Hill, is that what you... Um, yeah. One of the hills in Edinburgh. Yeah. Uh, it's there, and there's like this encampment in Arthur's seat. So like a lot of the things that he uses are very recognisable, at least to somebody who knows Edinburgh and maybe to people who don't, it might conjure up a different version of it, which is also valid. And I just really liked how weird it was. <laughs> like how different mm-hmm. in terms of like... Because it's, it is magic, but it's not just magic. No. It is a bit of history, but it's not just that. It is a bit of dystopia. It is a bit of, like, I think she's Zimbabwean, or he is Zimbabwean, I know, the writer. Yeah. She, I don't know, but, like, so uses some of the magic, like, some branch of African fantasy and magic and lore mm-hmm. and myth, and, like, places it into conversation with Scottish magic and fantasy and lore. And a lot of history figures from history are, like, very casually, like, mentioned and things. So it's a weird like genre bending thing. I don't know if I like the phrase genre bending. I'm using it. I'm committing to it. <laughs> it's like it's weird, and I like that. I like, but like yeah. in your case, it was like a comfortable, cozy yeah, read. Absolutely. In this, it's not like as mad as our friend Tamsin Muir's nope, thing. No, It's not. It's like pretty straightforward. Mm-hmm. But there's still like a mystery going on. She mm-hmm. doesn't quite know what's going on, and in both the books. She has to figure out. Uh, So in the second book, she has uh, landed herself an internship in one of the secret societies. She was hoping it would have been a paid apprenticeship. 
but it ends up being like an unpaid internship and she like m- like millions of people all over the world <laughs> have precarious employment and has to like take on extra jobs to you know like get money and food on the table so one of the things is her friend who works in this hospital of uh, late a lady of mysterious ailments has this boy who uh, a magic a student from magical school and they don't know what's wrong with him so like sort of gets her on board to figure it out and that leads down into all uh, all sorts of territories but for me usually i'm a very plot driven person mm-hmm. like i love like a good plot and i can forgive a lot if the plot is good here the plot almost is wondering yeah mm-hmm. and it doesn't really matter though mm-hmm. like to me to me it's more about the characters and the setting and the what is she discovering mm-hmm. more than like I, i didn't really care about this child yeah. in, the, in the hospital <laughs> i was like what yeah, whatever but i liked that i mean i didn't know where i was going but i liked the journey that we took so yeah. the journey was more important yeah. i think in both the books i believe you've read the third book yes and i've just started the fourth one which oh, is um, nice. coming out soon yeah. um i liked the all the characters as well i like her gran i like yeah. her sister i like her friends yeah. i think um they're great mm. characters that kind of really help her if that makes sense yeah and, and they're different they yeah, are like uh-huh. priya who is the sort of the wheelchair skateboarding or not skateboarding wheelchair boarding yeah. um <laughs> doctor like mm-hmm. and then uh, the other i forgot his name completely her other friend who works in the library mm-hmm. as like an apprentice there um and he is the one who's bringing that knowledge in and they're all working together i love that yeah, bit uh-huh, like they're absolutely. all getting there and she's like super grumpy so she's quite she's yeah. quite a fun character yeah. <laughs> to follow but you're right i think it's the dynamics of all yeah, yeah. the characters so it doesn't really ma- like if you're not into fantasy i don't think that that gets in the way a lot no, absolutely no if you're not into like history or dystopias there's like a little bit of everything i think yeah. which which is probably why it was just in general fiction that's you true quite fit it into that's <laughs> true yeah because the fantasy sure it's there but that's not the main no. it almost seems like an aside as does the history as does yeah, the dystopia absolutely. it can be anything that you want it to absolutely. be absolutely Yeah. No, I really enjoyed them as well. I'm quite looking forward to the next one because uh, the third one I think you'll like uh, um, very much as well. Uh, I need I'm to add good. that to my list, yes. and I'll quickly tell you about my for, uh, second mm-hmm. book because I have just started listening to it, so I don't have that much <laughs> to tell. But I think I'll just read a little bit of the description that was there just to give you the vibe of the thing. A rollicking history of England's earliest kings and queens. a story of narcissists excessive beheadings middle management insurrection and uncivil wars and more from like the uh, master comedian and storyteller david mitchell Excellent. and i think that's what sold me to it like i didn't really care about the kings and queens of england i'm like whatever you know <laughs> like it's i mean I, i like knowing history i like reading about history but not necessarily about individual kings mm-hmm. and queens because there've been so many yeah, there has. um <laughs> but i knew i i love david mitchell's like style of comedy mm-hmm. and like whatever his like intelligent sort of analysis and things and in this he brings about both he makes a lot of silly jokes is very silly about very serious things <laughs> and it's just so accessible mm-hmm. like you know it's especially listening to it but even reading i'm sure because his narrative voice Mm-hmm. is quite strong like he's very snarky at points and he's very like he doesn't take himself really seriously and he's not taking the subject matter super seriously he's giving you a lot of information and and it can be a lot right yeah. like history and kings and queens but he does it in such a light hand like you know light touch way mm-hmm. that you don't even know realize that you're learning so much which i think is the best way i think we've spoken about that before uh-huh. like some of the best like non fiction yeah. um thing is you know taking a subject and making it as you say accessible yeah. and making it interesting enough not dry and boring like at school where you're sitting there falling asleep mm-hmm. um you know that you're actually interested yeah. and you want to find out and that sounds as if it's also making the kings and queens human Absolutely. as opposed to just historical figures from many moons yeah. ago you know it's or who they did this they conquered this they won they died he does write about that so he starts with the roman like mm-hmm. the roman king so like the first his sort of methodology is a bit like 
DIY. <laughs> but like he starts from the Roman and I believe he ends, I, I say I believe because I've not reached there, Elizabeth the first. So basically when the monarchy had a like a really important impact on England mm-hmm. and things. Um, which again I don't know much about I know a little bit about like again like popular culture I've watched some musicals six and things and like museum exhibits like mm-hmm. I travel to different parts of the country and in Scot and but like Scottish history is so different as well this is I think very much focusing on English history mm-hmm. so I have like a mixed kind of understanding and I like that this presents like not a linear uh, mm-hmm. thing but like a more sort of straight well, not straightforward, <laughs> but a more um, interesting, I mm-hmm. guess, the mm-hmm. way. So, like, it's just one single theme, mm-hmm. but you're learning about a lot of other people. And he just does it. He's just really funny. Mm-hmm. So, like, I would 100% recommend this mm. to both people who might be familiar. Like, like you mm-hmm. say, in school, you might have nodded off. Yes. And think, especially if you've not done history and stuff. Mm-hmm. Like, he studied history in university. And he's quite, like laissez-faire about that as well like he's not like oh this is giving me the right to write about this he's again he's not like being super serious about it but it is factual like he's not like you know, he things sta- up. yeah <laughs> he starts off with like king arthur didn't exist i'm so sorry uh it's like so you know all these like so he has like drawn on actual scholarship mm-hmm. but he's made it like interesting and fun and engaging for mm-hmm. somebody who like me is not familiar with most of these people like I am the statistic like, you know, like I've beaten the algorithms <laughs> it's like a statistical anomaly, anomaly yeah mm-hmm. I've Excellent. beaten the algorithms as he said as well like he's like I don't know how you exist more people should be uh-huh, uh-huh. Mm-hmm. I, so like I had to I was like oh I'm so glad he's talking right at me <laughs> he can't believe I exist or to people who are familiar with it but may not be super like so I don't know if like an academic for example yeah. who has an expertise in this thing might obviously know about these things and might even be like excuse me you can't be making fun of this king's name <laughs> which he did like I spent the last like the 10 minutes walking from the station to the library this morning like he was just making fun <laughs> of a king that I can't like say in, in like a public yeah. library uh, podcast <laughs> but I just like completely like it just it's so silly and fun and like I fully recommend definitely it recommend, um, recommend it definitely for adults uh-huh. it's not yes. a mm-hmm. Well, I mean, younger no, people could. Yes, I think young adults. I think like a teenager, like with sort of like an interest mm-hmm. and like a high reading ability. Mm-hmm. It is for adults, but I'm not very like I know some people are like would be very mad at me for saying this, but I'm really not into the whole genre, uh, age categorization. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, because I honestly have been reading so much since I was a kid and I nobody was te- there telling me no. what to read and yeah, yeah. like because I was not surrounded by readers so I used to just pick up things that were highly inappropriate for me <laughs> and I turned out mostly okay well you are yeah. a statistical anomaly <laughs> but, <laughs> but, 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 so. <laughs> but no I think sometimes you know um, you know young kids can read above their, their Wage recommendation, mm-hmm. but this isn't a horrible history. This is like a proper. No, it is. Yes, uh, although it's almost like a horrible history for adults, okay, actually, okay. <laughs> which is yeah, that's quite a good way of putting it. So I think a committed younger person mm-hmm. who would want to like, and he, again, you can dip in and out of chapters. There are sections and chapters as well, so it's like really easy, mm-hmm. and they can decide. I think for themselves if it's something that you're like into. This is what I like. I feel like I trust children to be able to decide for themselves Mm -hmm. what they're ready for and things like I know that there are children like of the same like even an eight-year-olds like some eight-year-olds would be ready for much higher some would be too scared or too like I don't know wouldn't be able to read and same with adults right like there'd be adults who wouldn't want to or be interested in or be able to read a specific kind of book so I think if you're interested in the topic or if you like David Mitchell and his brand of madness this is the perfect kind Absolutely. of thing. Absolutely. It sounds really good. Yeah. I'm going to seek another book in if you I don't mind. I see the mm-hmm. one that's hiding in yes. the corner of the table. <laughs> and I think you're going to be a bit proud of me, Parry. Uh-huh. Um, so I also have not finished this. Uh-huh. Um, however, it's a non-fiction <gasps> book. Yes, big gasp. Um, and I'm not far into it at all. No. Um, but I'm actually quite enjoying it. 
<gasps> um, and I'm going to shoehorn it in here to this. Please um, do. Like, this is before <laughs> the non-fiction that we've just exactly. started. Uh-huh. Um, I'm still not picking up and showing you. Yeah, um, no, you're, you're so determined <laughs> behind it, I see. So we have an author visit uh-huh. in a couple of months' time. Please keep an eye on the website um, yeah. if you'd like to come along. Um, and I thought, oh, I better, mm-hmm. you know, have a wee look and see. Mm-hmm. And I started it and I'm, I'm keeping on reading it. It's now become my lunchtime book. Wow. Um, and yes. I'm that I know the kinds of lunchtime books you usually yes. read. So I'm even more like... <gasps> yes. And the way I'm shoehorning it in is because it is called A Tomb with a View. <laughs> see, it's a different oh, point of view. And oh, it is I by love it. Peter Ross. And basically, he just... You, I think, love it. Because it's one of those books that you dip in and out, he rambles just mm-hmm. on and on and on. Um, and it's about basically tombs and graveyards and things and the stories that they have to tell um, oh, throughout Britain. Yeah. He lives in Glasgow and he stays quite near, I want to say, Cathcart uh-huh. um, uh, a Cemetery. And he kind of, as I say, he rambles um, about the stories that are there. Um, and I'm going to read a wee tiny bit. I love it already. <laughs> yes. <laughs> now I don't have my glasses on, so I do apologise. Um, so at this point, he says um, he's talking to somebody called Sheldon, which I've not. Sheldon K. Goodman, founder of the Cemetery Club. Um, yes. Um, and Sheldon says millions of people have ended up in these remarkable places: heroes and villains, inventors and actors. People who once lived, laughed, loved and cried. I think it's important to resus- no, resurrect their stories and memories and achievements, which highlight the importance of the past and its effect on the future. And I thought that was quite a nice kind of summing up of cemeteries, that basically everybody goes there. You know, everybody at one point, dead or alive, will, will <laughs> go there. Um, and so far, I've really enjoyed it. It has been one of these books that you can kind of pick up on a lunch break, read a wee bit and then put down. Yeah. And as I say, Peter Ross here does kind of ramble a bit. Uh-huh. So you feel as if you're talking to somebody or somebody's talking to you. Um, it's not dry. It's yeah. not, you know, anything like that. So the, the subtitle is The Stories and Glories of Graveyards. Um, I love that. I'm, yes. s- I'm so impressed and proud <laughs> that you're reading this. Yes, Because it's you. a very unusual choice for your... Yes. It was, fun reading. Yes, it was basically he is coming, and it was the only book that on our shelf at the time by this author. Oh, I definitely want to do that. Was this. It. So, for example, the first kind of chapter is called Ivy, and it's the old town cemetery. Sterling Mark Sheridan, comedian. That's it. Uh, Love and death in Whitby. Um, the second one is Angels, and we're in Brompton in London, um, and then the queerly departed. So. I've not quite got there yet, but it seems to be um, he goes on tour, like, of a graveyard. You know how you do, like, oh, ghost tours and yeah, things like that? Yeah. Um, but this is a tour of graveyard, and it goes around um, people who have been kind of gay or lesbian or, ah, you know... like, so the queer historical uh-huh, figures, yeah, writing them they, themselves into, like, the present. Uh-huh, yes, um, and it seems to just be kind of... He just talks to people Um, and as I say I keep saying this but he just kind of rambles no but I love it so that it's actually going on right now the Glasgow Doors Open uh, Festival I think it started this week Mm -hmm. but a couple of years ago I had gone for a walking tour Mm -hmm. like they have a lot of different walking tours during the thing and I'd gone to the southern necropolis in Mm -hmm. Glasgow and there was exactly like this a person I don't know who it was I don't think it was Peter Ross or Peter Ray, <laughs> but there was someone mu- much like him, a rambler, yes, like both excellent. verbally and like <laughs> sort of physically. And he took us around like the different, uh, I mean, it's huge, but he took us around some major like sort of figures mm-hmm. and drew attention to them in a way like the graveyards that we would have just walked past, the gravestones, and had such interesting stories. And they were not always like these glorious people, no, like, like these big, important, rich people who are usually like, especially in the main necropolis mm-hmm. in Glasgow, that's usually who ended up there. And especially with the fancy like gravestones or like statues and things. He took us to different parts and just sort of stitched this narrative of history of like 
hidden corners of like things that we wouldn't have encountered mm-hmm. otherwise and again like you were saying it was very much like a lot of digressions mm-hmm. and you know going this way and and then sometimes people in the audience would like add something that they knew or ask mm-hmm. a question that's so, basically that's in a bit yeah, yeah so this so this is absolutely mm-hmm. for me because mm-hmm. it's not something like i don't obviously like in india we have graveyard like mm-hmm. for muslim and christian burials but in like most of because it's a hindu majority country it's usually like cremations mm-hmm. that we have and our cremations are different from the kinds of cremations that you have here as well at least they used to be when i was growing up so for me graveyards is not a thing so if you would have said if i'd been growing up in india i would probably never have gone to a graveyard mm-hmm. well i had christian friends so maybe once <laughs> like maybe once they died maybe but it's not a thing like it is here mm-hmm. where you go like i went for a picnic once i think like it was just a nice day and people it's not this sacrosanct space mm-hmm. yeah. it's very much a space for the public mm-hmm. it seems like yeah. like in the necropolis like me and like these two other friends we just like wandered around and you know like just sat and like just looked at some of the gravestones and things but it's felt more like accessible it felt yeah. like and but you don't know there's so much stuff that you don't know mm-hmm. like i love doing this i love like when i'm in a park and things you know those benches uh-huh. that they have yeah. those dedications yeah. because even those small little dedications give you so much mm-hmm, yeah. about like whoever it was even just a glimpse and grave stones i feel Absolutely. like do that Absolutely. but having someone like peter or the person we went to with like on this walking tour with like you're missing out on so much Absolutely. and they know these things yeah. that and that's what he seems to have done so far um, as i say i'm not very far into no. it um, but it is you know it's not about the big kind of it does mention some famous people and things but it's more of like you know the the couple that that died at the same time on the same day you know that got married you know 40 years before in the same time the same day you know things like that yeah. um it's just really quite interesting yeah. um I, i'm i'm very much enjoying it at the moment and he seems to get like um he just talks to people and they just talk to him um so at one point he was talking to somebody i think it was in the Brompton one um whose son had passed away. and i must say it's not a sad book you're not sitting there you know you know yeah. it's more kind of lively yeah. um when he was talking to a man who, um, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> who had like kind of made a um kind of monument to his, his son that passed away and there's apparently like a life size model of of the son that you can go and sit beside Aww. um you know and it's it's things like that that he's just kind of making it as you see more more interesting and more yeah. more the stories of the people yeah. um and I'm I'm really enjoying it so far um, and it's so like for me that sounds so cool yeah. because like okay now obviously there are people who know the I mean maybe there are people who know like in this case the parents and then you know they live however many years but at one point it will almost be decontextualized unless the family stays in the same place yeah. and remembers the person mm-hmm. like through stories or whatever but i like i love that as well mm-hmm. i love the yeah. idea of some like a uh, descendants revisiting this mm-hmm. spaces but i also love the idea of strangers mm-hmm. like for a moment in time like far into the future where the person would never have imagined still like standing or sitting and looking and remembering a person they would never have met and they until Absolutely. like they see this one thing mm-hmm. in the graveyard or in the public park or at the seaside or whatever well i was just sort of as you were talking there having a quick look um and he he basically says that you know he's built this to last and it will outlast him yeah. and he likes the idea of somebody coming up and sitting beside yeah. you know who might not know the family and might not but can come and sit beside and kind of yeah. you know have that moment to himself and yeah. um, Peter Ross also right at the beginning of the book was talking about um covid times mm. um, and how that quite often people would walk around for the exercise yeah. um you know and basically walk their dog and things yeah. like that and you know how that's he he kind of walked through and we'd see all the different people walking through who would never usually go yeah, do you know what i mean that's true. um and it's just I, I'm, i'm quite surprised that i'm enjoying it as much as i am yeah. um, <laughs> no see that's the thing though i think non fiction for me as well like for like the longest time 
has a really bad rap mm-hmm. because you think of non-fiction as being and there are there are books that Absolutely. are like really dry and intense and there are audiences for them as well like some people don't want like silly david mitchell talking <laughs> silly things saying silly things about kings and queens mm-hmm. or like about tombs like this, but it's not for them i guess mm-hmm. like or maybe it might be if they gave themselves gave it a chance but it's not it's fine yeah. <laughs> they don't have to be for They're everyone yeah but there are especially like i think we live in such a golden age of all kinds of literature children's publishing non fiction like just Absolutely. even fiction there's so many things out there that i think that you can't like i think sort of say that all non fiction is this one thing no, absolutely. because even within like a history genre or architecture whatever this would be classed under there's so many different things so some would be like for students maybe mm-hmm. some would be for like you know like history buff some would be for like i guess people who really into death gods mm. yeah <laughs> so yeah so it, it, there's just so much absolutely. out there that i think more people who are really into fiction because i think there used to be a stereotype as well that men read non fiction and women absolutely. read fiction mm-hmm. i don't know how true that is or if this is just something i've made, made up no i think there was a reputation you know a long time ago that yes. that's you know um how it would be mm-hmm. um, and maybe it was true i don't know but i think that there's such fantastic work being done by all genders like so men women whatever and i think like if you've been like put off by non fiction well look at you yes <laughs> like can you imagine when we first started this no. podcast when non fiction you'd be like ah oh, what no exactly <laughs> yeah a graphic novels as well Absolutely. and like mysteries with me like i used to be like mystery okay but now i like go uh-huh, yeah, towards yeah. it so it's i think like if you are if you find something you're interested in for whatever reason if it's an author who's coming to talk and i definitely would want to attend this session yes. i think it's i think it's like you just need that interest and like the correct Absolutely. thing to meet at that time and sometimes it doesn't happen and that's fine there's lots of other stuff for you to read but if it does happen i think like rather than being like oh non fiction mm-hmm. oh non fiction exactly it might be nice it's like there's something for everyone yeah uh-huh. <laughs> so i think we uh, like given lots of different points yes. of view today <laughs> do you know what's up next i do So B has went all corporate on us, oh. um, because the next um, podcast is broadcasted in the Green Libraries Week. Ah, oh, she has yes. gone corporate, yes. but she has an agenda. She has a plan. Yes, she she has. <laughs> um, and basically, it's about how, as far as I can tell, it's like um, you know, libraries and kind of recycling you know you know oh. that kind of um thing however b has been totally corporate no, no. because our theme is just green oh right okay <laughs> so we can take that any way we want but she's kind of squished that in for green libraries week Ooh. Um, oh yes. i i also want to find out more about this green libraries yes and perhaps i should have put it that that be told us just told us about yeah, literally so yes we don't so we know no, we don't so now is our chance to go and uh, research and for our next episode <laughs> if we remember we will come with more information yes. about green libraries absolutely. week absolutely and about the color green yes so uh, just green green just green okay mm-hmm. that's a uh, I'm not going to say that sounds doable no, because, because that's what I thought. <laughs> Although I think we both thought it. We did, we did. Yes. Yes. And maybe this is how we go. This yes. is like you know we just like jazz it up. How we roll. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But yes, yeah, so uh, otherwise thanks so otherwise otherwise thanks so much for listening. See you next time. Bye. Bye.